Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome to the DMU live stream, where we'll be talking all about your DMU safety and answering your questions. Uh, we're very happy that you could join us. Uh, just drop a comment to you know say hello. Uh, my name is Callum. And my name is Maddie, and we're both students at DMU, and we're both involved with Demon Media. Um, we're actually on both in the same course, is that what <laughs> Yes, we are. We do media production. Uh, we're in our second year, so, you know, we're yeah. about halfway there. You know, yeah. Bon Jovi would be proud. <laughs> uh, all this week, we've been collecting your questions about DMU safety, and our guests from the university will be answering them today. So if you didn't get the chance to submit your question beforehand, uh, your DMU safety, uh, oh wait, uh, sorry, if you didn't get the chance to submit your question beforehand, please ask it in the comments and we will do our best to answer them if we have time at the end. Now, it's time to meet our guest for today. First, it's Professor Jackie, I can't read this in name, La Jackie Lab. Lab. Lab, Lab, yeah, sorry. Jackie Lobby. Lobby. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those names. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Callum. Hello. Oh, yes. Another yeah, um, guest. Sorry. Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, yes, this is also Umesh Desai uh, from States. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and dive into the questions I have been given by Lawrence. So, um, do you reckon you can explain a bit um, how, like, the DMU track and trace system works? No, hang on, Callum, we've got oh, another oh, guest again. Yeah. Wait, oh, do we? Oh, do we? Okay, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought we were going one at a time. No, 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 no. Um, sorry, we've got another guest. Is uh, Fai D Divon? Divon. Yes? Is that how you pronounce it? It's B Donovan. Hi. B Donovan, yes. Um, who's going to tell us all about um, the Good Neighbours Network. And then finally, we have uh, Laura Flowers. Is that how you... Yeah, Laura Flowers? Yes, yeah. hello. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you everyone for coming. Welcome. Sorry, I had a little hiccup there. <laughs> my bad, my bad. I'm really sorry. Uh, Do you well, want us to maybe say a little bit first, Maddie, before we go into the questions about uh, just sort of introducing a little bit about um, your DMU safety and some of the things that we've been developing? That'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> right. Um, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll start. So I'm Jackie Lobby, I'm PDC academic at the university, and basically that means that I have responsible responsibility for your academic experience across the board. So thinking about your teaching and learning, uh, about uh, the various things that you do while you're on campus that are associated with your learning, thinking about, for instance, your study spaces, um, and uh, anything really to do with what it means to be a student at DMU. So I um, just wanted to say a little bit about your DMU safety. Um, there will be plenty of time to ask questions, so anything that I don't cover, then by all means, uh, will I think will come up in the questions anyway. But I um, just wanted to talk in general terms so far that um, all of our advice, guidance, and information about how we've prepared our campus and how we've been thinking about what this academic year would look like can really be found on your DMU safety. It's all about keeping each other safe. So quite early on, we developed a, a shared commitment approach, which basically means that we think about what it means to be on campus, to be on campus together, um, what that means in these very difficult times when we can't interact in the same kind of way, and where we have a lot of limitations on our physical behavior. So our shared commitment is really about looking out for each other and thinking about these things at all times when we're on campus. Um, because we knew that we would not be able to uh, approach your teaching in exactly the same way this year as we would have done in the past. We've been preparing all summer long for the blended learning that you have hopefully started to experience now. And this basically means trying to achieve a balance between your on-campus learning and your online learning, and then achieving a balance in your online learning between the kind of live learning and the pre-recorded lectures and other, other materials that you're able to access. Um, when you're on campus, and Umesh will be able to say more about this as well. We've put a, a lot of thought into what it means to be uh, working and learning on a socially distanced campus. So if you've been around so far, you will have seen that uh, the, the pavement is laid out uh, in, in sort of with directions on where to go. All of our rooms and buildings with one-way systems and directional arrows about how to get through the buildings in the safest way possible. All of our teaching rooms are laid out in a socially distanced pattern. 
And one thing that is new uh, this week that you will see next week definitely is that we have actually um, put put uh, table numbers, uh, seat numbers for all of the places that you will be sitting when you're in your teaching rooms. And this is for a very specific reason. So as you know, um, if if you are uh, in uh, if you are in um, proximity, the best word I think, to somebody who has tested positive, then you are meant to go into self isolation. Proximity means anything less than two meters, and that means even if you're wearing a face mask. Now, in all of our teaching rooms, we are requiring you to wear a face mask unless you can't, and if you can't wear one for for health reasons or or other sort of personal reasons, then we're asking you to signal that in some way by wearing, for instance, the yellow lanyard. By putting the seat numbers uh, at the places where you'll be seat sitting, it means that if there is a positive case in the classroom, it's only those students who have been in that proximity to that positive case who have to go into self-isolation. And it essentially means we don't have to send whole classes of students into self-isolation unnecessarily, because clearly nobody wants to go into self-isolation if they don't have to. Um, it means other things have changed in terms of the way in which you learn in the classroom. Unfortunately, we can't do the same kinds of things with a lot of small group work. Uh, students have to sit facing forward. It's almost like being the Victorian times, basically, when it comes to, to uh, teaching and learning. But it's all towards maintaining your health and safety in the best possible way that we can. Um, in terms of your online learning, lectures have been working really hard to make this work very effectively for you. They're learning as well. They're in a way learning with you. They're, they're that little bit further uh, ahead, um, and they've been working really hard to find new ways of making it interesting and engaging. And what I'm finding as well when I'm doing things online, there are lots of really interesting ways in which we can interact with each other online that are different but really effective to what it means to interact with each other face to face. So for instance, things like the, the chat function, where if you maybe don't feel comfortable about raising your hand in class or speaking in class, uh, you can put comments and questions in the chat function and interact in that kind of way. So it provides certain opportunities, I think, that hopefully will make your, your learning really effective and engaging, um, and that will just continue to get better and better. Now, I know so for some students um, who might be in self-isolation, for instance, or might be having difficulties actually reaching campus, and you can't be here for our on-campus teaching, when you've got that kind of very legitimate reason, um, all, all of the face-to-face on-campus teaching is meant to also have a virtual version made available and posted probably after the meeting of the face-to-face -face, um, session so that you can at least get a flavor of what happened in the class that you missed. And I know very much from talking with colleagues within faculties that they think about this really carefully because they know that it'll be different to pick up a virtual version. And in some classes, maybe more practically oriented classes, they're thinking very hard about how to make sure that if you've missed something really key about learning how to use a piece of equipment or learning how to work with certain materials, that there are ways to, to get that learning to you uh, in a different kind of way. And finally, just to say um, that we are very well aware that things are changing in the country almost on a daily basis, it feels like. Um, and that, that does mean we need to be actively planning for what might happen if we had to move more of our teaching than we currently have online. So I really want to just uh, um, hope that you, you feel reassured that all of this thinking is going on with your lecturers that they're thinking very much about what it might mean if the classes that are currently on campus have to move online and that there is a plan in place so that you won't be left hanging uh, and that your learning outcomes can still be achieved. So I'm not going to say much more than that from now. I'm going to wait for the questions to come in and hand back to Callum. Okay, uh, sweet. So um, I believe now um, we're going to speak to Umesh about um, from Estates, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, my name is Umesh Desai. I'm the Director of Estates and Facilities, and my role is to ensure that the campus that you're studying in is safe and uh, and COVID, COVID compliant. So throughout the summer, um, my team and I have been working extensively across the campus, making sure that we put measures in place to ensure your safety and your protection. So if you've already been around campus, as Jackie mentioned earlier, you will see signage around every building uh, to guiding you uh, which way to go, which way not to go, etc. There'll be signs showing you how you should sort of uh, maintain washing your hygiene, not washing your hands. Um, there'll be arrows pointing you to the right direction, but that's more than that. So it's all about the, the guidance documents, 
what you should do, what you shouldn't do. We've put screens up throughout all of our buildings to protect you and also uh, um, uh, members of staff uh, from uh, not coming to contact to each other. We've actually removed furniture in a lot of places so that you're physically and socially distanced. And there's a lot of extra works that we've done. It's not just academic buildings that we've done uh, safety measures in. Our leisure facilities and our sports centres have also had works done to them as well to ensure that you can enjoy some of the, uh, the pastoral work um, and the social side of things in a safe and compliant manner as well. Visit our catering uh, outlets, we've made sure that they are socially compliant and also safe as well. You'll see screens there and the staff are there more than well, are waiting to, for you to sort of help you when you need to. Our IT labs, uh, you know, they're all open and they've all got uh, wipes and sanitizers, uh, liquids there, so that when you go in and uh, you want to use IT kit, you know, you're entitled to go and wipe down the kit beforehand and also before you finish. So you'll find lots of measures on our buildings, including hand sanitizers around our buildings. There's over 450 hand sanitizers we put in our buildings, so there'll be plenty wherever you need to go. Something that you may have uh, not been aware of in the last two or three weeks, if you have been around campus, you'll have seen stands. So I've had some of my colleagues uh, man these stands and we're handing out free face masks. So each student will be entitled to two face masks each. If you've not had yours, you've got a chance today and tomorrow to go and collect those. I urge that you do that because they are very good face masks and we're requiring all students and staff to wear face coverings when they're inside our buildings. Um, there's a whole lot more that we've actually done. Uh, we've got cleaning in place, we've got new cleaning teams, additional cleaning teams, and uh, enhanced cleaning taking place. So there's uh, cleaners working around, around the clock uh, in all the buildings, wiping surfaces, wiping touch points, making sure they're doing uh, enhanced clean, deep cleans. And should we ever have a problem, they will come along and actually do a, a full clean in those areas as well. But touch wood, we've not had any of those to date. Student accommodation as well, the accommodation that we actually manage, uh, we've made sure that there's measures in place there as well to keep you safe and secure through COVID, uh, with additional hand sanitizer points, additional cleaning, and also additional facilities within those flats so that students can actually self-use and self-service and clean areas themselves as well. Um, so I'm going to save a lot of my other questions for later on if you have any, and I'll come back to you. Thank you, Callum. Okay, I saw my mic got muted. Okay. We're now going to speak to um, Fee Donovan about what was it again? The Sorry. Good Neighbour Scheme. Good Neighbour Scheme, that was it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And that's about um, students, yes. isn't it? Um, uh, so I'm Fee Donovan, I'm Head of Public Engagement. And we run the DMU Local Programme, which is uh, community-based outreach and schools-based outreach. Uh, so students can volunteer to help communities. And one of the things we recognise is that students is their, are their own community right now. And in response to a couple of questions and some queries, we decided that we'd set up the Good Neighbour Network, which is really where students can uh, volunteer to help each other out. Um, it can be a mix of practical or emotional support or even just referring people who are new to Leicester or new to university or living in strange accommodation and are isolating and having, you know, a, a sometimes quite lonely time to reach out to them and be that good neighbour. It could be picking up a parcel or just being a friendly and listening ear at times. Um, we also think it's quite a great way for students to get involved in a network of volunteering and organising their own communities of support because that also gives you a bit of skills and, and, and developing your own leadership and engagement with others. Um, so we've just started the scheme and we've had quite a few sign ups already and we were running briefing sessions for people who want to take part and sign up. And you can sign up by uh, contacting local at dmu.ac.uk or actually uh, via the uh, your safety website. Uh, there's a link on there to the My Gateway opportunity. But one of the things we recognise is this is about you helping each other and you might have different ideas about the kind of practical and um, informal support that you might want to deliver to people who live either in your accommodation block or in your local community and we think it might appeal and it certainly is appealing to I think about 50 students so far have signed up since last week so there is a growing network and community of people who want to be those good neighbours um, and I'm sure there'll be questions arising really as we move through but um, from my point of view I'm quite um, quite pleased to see so many people wanting to help each other because I think it is a, a difficult time and unfamiliar situations are happening particularly for people who are new to the city or new to university and it's nice to see people wanting to reach out and help each other so 
yeah, sign up via the link and we can tell you more about the scheme. I'm sure there'll be questions later that I'm happy to answer. So thank you. I think back to Callum. Thank you very much. All righty. And uh, last but not least, we have Laura from the DSU. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Yeah, as Callum says, my name's Laura, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the academic executive at the Students' Union. So um, my job and my um, role throughout all of this has been to represent some of your interests and let the university know what you're thinking. So um, throughout this period, myself and your other executive officers have been involved voicing your opinions and thoughts regarding everything related to blended learning. In particular, we've made sure that the student voice is listened to when we're talking about safety because it's so important. And it's been really great to be involved in the creation of your DMU safety. We have also recently launched our Are You OK campaign, um, which you can find on our website. I think there should be a link coming very shortly, um, which is acts as a little bit of a check in just to make sure that you're OK. Yeah, that's it. I like it when it magically appears. <laughs> it's a check-in to check on how, how you're doing, your welfare, and if there's anything that we can do to support you um, academically as well. So if there is anything that you want to bring up, you want us to work on, please let us know um, by this link. Um, today, I'm really happy to be here and I'm also happy to answer any of your questions surrounding student voice or student experience um, that I'm sure we'll hear shortly about um, soon. Yes, back okay, in Okay, sweet. And now, uh, I believe it is time for the Q&A session. Thank you very much, everyone, for giving you peace. Now we are going to move over to the Q&A session. So we've collected your questions all week, but if you didn't get the chance to submit one, leave it in the comments, we'll do our best. Uh, but onto the first question. So every time I've been on campus, I get the NA NHS notification saying that I've been exposed and it feels unsafe. Um, so uh, I, I'm pretty sure I can answer this one. Um, so when exposure login is switched on, uh, if you have like, you know, whether an Apple or an Android phone, um, so you go into your settings and you enable COVID exposure login, um, which is what I believe the NHS app uses um, to, like, you know, give you notifications. For example, if you've come into close contact with somebody who's tested positive, um, sometimes it may, may seem as though these messages, you know, disappear or, um, you know, don't come up. But, um, you know, they're just default messages to make sure that uh, the text working. Um, does anybody else want to say like an extra piece on this uh, on this question at all? I'm happy to say something. I mean, I've, I've gotten this kind of message as well. And the first time I got it, I thought, oh, my God, what does that mean? You know, and I thought, do I do I instantly go into self-isolation? It, it just seemed to come from nowhere. And I think it's probably one of those kind of things where probably maybe a little bit more clarity of explanation would have been helpful coming from, say, the government around something like this. But it, it's not an actual message of exposure to COVID, it does seem to be just a default kind of message that reassures you that the mechanism is actually working. So there's no need to feel unsafe from the point of view of getting that message. Um, it's just a, it's a, a mechanical kind of thing. Forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> um, our next question is, um, Will you move more teachers online if we enter a tier three uh, where students will have to go home? And uh, now, Jackie and Laura, I believe your expertise on this. So I'll let one of you two answer this one. Yeah, I'll start and then Laura, if you want to I'll pitch pick in. me up on <laughs> this, but I don't guess so. So basically, um, the tier three seems to be operating slightly differently in the various parts of the country where it has come into effect. Um, but the one thing that um, hasn't happened in any of the tier three areas is that educational settings have closed. So even in tier three parts of the country, universities remain open and universities remain physically open as well. So you may have seen that some universities have decided to put uh, their provision online for a short period of time, say for a couple of weeks. That's been the university's own decision and it hasn't really had anything to do with the tier that the city might be in. But the, the tier itself doesn't mandate the physical closing of, of campuses. And indeed the government is quite clear that it wants educational settings to stay open because education is basically about the most important thing we have going on uh, in the country right now. So if for instance, Leicester or the, the region were to go into tier three, 
that wouldn't automatically mean that we would have to put things online. And it, it actually would also not automatically mean that students would go home. Um, the, the capacity of, of people to travel from place to place is also one of those things that seems to be um, sort of geographically different depending which part, which kind of tier three you're actually in. What I can say is that were we to find ourselves in that kind of situation, we would have extremely clear information for every student as well as every member of staff about what it actually meant and what you could expect and what those next stages would be. Uh, and if I just go back to what I was saying earlier, we are very well prepared for if we do need to move things online, then your teaching will still go on. That's part of the, the plan that, that every lecturer is working towards. But tier three in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean that, and it doesn't necessarily mean that, that suddenly um, people do leave their, their university towns um, for those who have moved to them and go home. Laura, did you want to add anything to that? I, mean, I think you've covered pretty much everything. But um, just to sort of reinforce that um, we are working really hard to support you and um, ensure that your voices is heard through this. So please don't worry. Um, if there is the case that we do need to move online, um, we'll be working with the university to create those clear communications telling, what ha telling everything what happens. But at the minute, there's no indication that that's going to happen. Thank you very much, ladies. Um, we're now going to talk about uh, halls. So. <clears throat> Can I stay in halls during my 14 day quarantine? I'm an international student, so um, I'm one of these people affected by this. I'm in halls at the moment and I'm going to hand this question over to Amesh. Thank you. Thank you, Maddie. So uh, absolutely, if you're an international student, uh, one of the countries that are requiring quarantine, then you can stay in the halls without doubt and you don't need to pay, you don't need to pay any fees or your rent for the first two weeks. So that guarantee we have given as a university but you have to be one of the countries that are actually still on that quarantine list and there's no problem with that at all. Thank you very much. Um, Callum, I'll let you read this one. Uh, okay, so uh, what are the university's plans for potentially letting students go home for Christmas break? So uh, I believe, does anybody want to go ahead and pick this one up? I'll, I'll have a start on this one. So um, basically, students are grown-ups and so it's not up to the university to either let or not let you go anywhere really um, if we we don't yet know uh, whether the government will have some guidance or point of view on this but um, unless you're in self-isolation which means obviously you're meant to stay put and, and isolate until you know where you stand um, in terms of, of whether you've contracted COVID or not um, your, your movement is, is really your own business. Um, what we would say is that as long as the university is in term, we would like you to stick around because otherwise you will miss out on some of your learning. Um, and in particular, if you're not um, on campus, you won't be able to pick up your on-campus um, teaching. But uh, the university is not in control of your movements in this kind of way. So um, you live where you live and you you obey obviously the 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 universe. Uh, sorry, the the, um, the national restrictions that may be in place. You think about the rule of six, where that's still allowed. You don't mix households, etc. But in terms of that kind of the movement from say here to home or vice versa, the only thing that might impact that might be something that the government might decide to recommend. And if we're in that position, then again we would make sure that it was absolutely clear what your options are, what uh, what it means for you as students, and that would be whether you're living in halls, in either our own halls, in uh, in the nominated halls that we work with, or indeed if you're in private accommodation. We just want to make sure you really understood what that kind of thing would mean for you as a student. Fair enough. Very well answered. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so our next question. Can I still commute to Leicester from South Derbyshire? Um, would anybody like to? I, okay, there you go. Yeah, I, I can certainly uh, uh, attempt to sort of answer that one. So, um, again, as Jackie mentioned, it's, it, it is down to the government restrictions and whatever they're putting in the local areas. Um, as far as I'm aware, there aren't any restrictions from Derbyshire coming to Leicester, um, and the government is very clear throughout this uh, pandemic, they want to keep universities open. So in order to keep them open, students are going to need to come to campus if that means traveling from 
South Derbyshire to Leicester, that's absolutely fine because that's something they want to continue to do. I would advise people just to check any local restrictions they may have in their area that they're travelling from. Yeah, okay. thank you very much. Uh, what should I do if I can't see my online classes on Blackboard? Now, me and Callum know exactly all about this, oh, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> uh, in media yeah. production especially, we've got quite a lot of mix of like online courses as well as in classes. So we're trying to find lectures and labs that haven't been uploaded yet because it's not quite the right day or whatever's going on. Um, who would also like to put a little input on that as well? Uh, Jackie and Laura? Yes. I mean, I'm happy to... Oh, no, you, Julia, you start, Laura. You start. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it does completely depend on the issue whether it's sort of like a tech issue in the case that you'd have to contact ITMS or um, if it's more like a, of a program based issue in the um, just say like your modules aren't appearing you perhaps haven't been registered onto the right, right ones you need to speak to your program teams and um, Jackie is yeah I think that's true so that? if, if it's um if it's say you're you're uh, timetabled online learning and you can't Got onto it, then it's probably something to do with some kind of either timetable issue or, as Laura said, an ITMS issue. And you would go to ITMS, you go to your program leader just to figure out well, where, where does it actually lie. If it's the kind of online pre recorded material, it might be that um, it's just not there yet, but it will be there yet. So um, everything is meant to be uploaded by no later than. Thursday at four o'clock of the week before you need the material. So we're in week three now. If you've got um, classes next week that you would have lectures that relate to that, they should have been uploaded by yesterday, uh, no, today, Thursday, by today at four. Um, and so if you check earlier, you may not see it. But um, it is also the case that um, we've, uh, we've got answers to a lot of these kind of IT related questions in our IT student handbook, which you can find on your DMU future. And also, if you haven't yet taken the How Do I Learn in a Blended Environment mini module, you should also take that because quite a few of these kind of questions about what do I do if this happens or what do we do if that happens, those are answered in these kind of things, either the handbook, handbook or the module or sometimes in both those areas. So I would really encourage you to explore the Your DMU Future website, looking for these uh, resources, take the module um, because a lot of answers are going to be answered just by doing those two things. Thank you very much. Uh, so a big question, um, how can I join a society this year? So I believe, Laura, will you have the, the best? Yes. Um, so you can join a society by going to our website, which is um clicking on Get Involved, which is at the top, and on there you can find a list of all of our sports teams and societies, and you can join it through there. They're all super active on social media as well, so um, if you do have one specifically on mind, you can contact them there and see what they're up to and get involved. But I'd really encourage you to do so. They're wonderful. <laughs> Yes, yes, demon media is, is our choice of society. Wait, wait, I wonder why. <laughs> um, um, who do I tell if I uh, test positive for COVID nineteen? And um, who would like to do this question? B, do you want to pick this one up? Pass it over to you. Oh, your mic's not on. Your mic. Okay, I think I'm there now. Sorry, I've got to unmute myself. Um, so there is um, an online form if you um, uh, test positive for um, COVID-19. There you go, safe trace notifiers just come up on the screen beautifully. Um, and also you're advised to contact your um, student advice centre as well in your faculty. Um, and then uh, a load of information is related to you. And a lot of that is about either referral to different support services or different activities you can get involved in while you are isolating or indeed tested positive and need to quarantine. Um, so yeah, then that's also when things like Good Neighbour kick in. So um, yeah, make sure you fill in the online form at Safe Trace Notify. Sweet. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm self-isolating and I'm worried about missing face-to-face -face teaching. Uh, what can I do? So okay, I'll pick this one up. So um, this is where you would want to be able to draw on the virtual versions 
of the on-campus face-to-face teaching that would have been offered. And if you don't really quite know how to do that, then I would say get in touch with your module leader to say, how can I find this virtual version? You know, is it on Blackboard or or where is it? But these virtual versions are, are being developed specifically for students who can't get to campus because they might be self-isolating or because they might be ill with COVID or these kinds of, of reasons. So they are meant to be there. As I say, if you can't find it or you don't know how to find it, just ask you through your module leader, your program leader, and they should be able to point you straight towards it. Thank you very much. Um, what is the difference between DMU Safe and Trace and the NHS? NHS app. Um, who would like to answer this one? Any? I, I, I can answer that. Thank you, Maddie. Um, so the, the main difference, the number of differences, but the main one is the DMU Safe Trace, as it says in the title, is a university Safe Trace app, uh, whereas the NHS one is a national app that's been released by the NHS. So uh, I'm sorry that sounds a bit obvious, but that you know, they are the main key differences there. Uh, the NHS app actually looks after sort of mainly the public buildings where the public are accessing uh, buildings and not all of our buildings are accessible by the public. So you'll see that app in people like places like the campus center, the food village and the library and the gym. You know, other places won't have the NHS app in our buildings. Whereas the DMU one is something that we've actually uh, uh, designed and introduced ourselves to help and track students ourselves and understand where they've been within our buildings. And you will find these apps uh, and posters all over campus and all over the place. Uh, do be mindful that these uh, apps are actually a different zones, so they may not be obvious, obvious, always obvious. Sorry, but when you go from one area to another, you do need to keep clicking onto these apps so that you can record where you've been. And this is to help us and you to track if there is an outbreak or the problem as to where you've been, so we can go and do a clean, etc., rather than having to close whole buildings or whole large areas around for no reason. So, do look, download both apps. Do use them both. Both important and make sure that you actually use a DMU Safe Trace app as you move around different buildings and to different spaces because each code is slightly different. Thank you very much. Um, how can I volunteer for the Good Neighbour program? I want to help. So Fee, can you tell us all about that please? Yeah, sure. I think I mentioned it earlier on and you can sign up via the My Gateway link or by emailing us at local at dmu.ac.uk. And I think I mentioned, but you sign up, we'll tell you a bit more about the scheme and then we'll tell you what it involves really and how you can build your own community of support. There's quite a few people already, so you get to be you know, connected with other volunteers as well, which might be quite nice and help you maybe make some different friends. A bit like a, a, bit like a society or a, or a sports team, or it's just another activity that you can get involved in. So yeah, sign up via that link and we'll send you all the information. That you need. Thank you very much. Um, how can I make friends? if I can't socialize? Well, that's a very good question. Who would like to take this one on? I'm happy to start it. Um, so you can still socialize if you've got flatmates, you can socialize with your flatmates. Um, so I'd really encourage you to chat to them and get to know them perhaps if you don't know, you haven't already. Um, but I'd also encourage you to look at what we're doing at the Students' Union. Um, so we're currently holding events um, like weekly Netflix parties. We've also got some really interesting things planned for the next couple of weeks. So keep an eye on our website and our social medias for that as well. Um, but you can, you can also, as I mentioned earlier, um, make friends through societies i mean um maddie callum you you're both in demon aren't you yes. um have have you had good good um opportunities of making friends through that i'll switch it around <laughs> uh, we've had our first dmu social uh sorry dmu social demon social <laughs> that was a online quiz so we um post a link on our membership page um, which is just sort of demon either TV, demon radio, uh, demon FM, or just demon in general, or even demon magazine. Because we've got three different strands. Forgot to mention that. <laughs> four now, four. It's four. Oh, so. Yeah, four. Completely forgot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. Uh, we've managed to get I think a few new members in there. It's all about confidence, really, because I know uh, quite a lot of freshers are very awkward, you know, being new to everything and not knowing a lot of new people. Um, we are trying to uh, possibly um, get some in the works where we have um, five freshers to each producer, but we're working on how we can sort of do that at the moment. But to be honest, when it comes to doing your course and making friends via your course, I would suggest the Facebook groups. 
um because you have a facebook group within your course and have everyone in there sort of let you know what's going on i mean i know for me and callum we've constantly been out of it trying to sort out where, where we are yeah, what we're doing, yeah, that and that. yeah um but we've made a hell of a lot of new friends this year i'd say um from either being in face-to-face -face classes or just being online with people um but it's all about i say confidence and just sort of wanting to talk to people um yeah definitely uh, <laughs> I was going to say as well as that, um, you know, there's other groups I'm new to DMU on Facebook and stuff, uh, you Society Facebooks as well, but like, Society's a big one as well, like, I'm, one of the freshers won, our, won the pub quiz social that we did, so, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's never, it's never been a better time to get involved, but yeah, no, genuinely, like, Societies, Facebook groups, stuff like that, in in the absence of what seems to be face-to-face -face soci uh, socialisation, uh, stuff stuff like that, like Facebook groups, like society, is a probably best way of like you know, um, getting socialized socialized with other people. I know like places like Demon, very good place to start, but you know, of course I'm gonna say that. Not but. biased at all. <laughs> no, I love not. that. <laughs> if I could just put a plug in as well for the for the learning side of it, because you, there's also socializing through your learning. So, for instance, if you if you've got your uh, either your online or your face-to-face -face modules, there are ways in which you could use that to get to know um, your course mates a little more closely as well and, you know, put together, for instance, virtual study groups and that kind of thing, because that's also going to help uh, in terms of, of anchoring some of that learning. Whereas, uh, you know, in the past, you might be able to take mm -hmm. class together and go and have a coffee or whatever and talk over, you know, what it was you're just learning. You can still do that in a virtual environment. It's, it's a little, maybe at first feels a little more artificial, but the more you do it, the more you get used to it, the more natural it does feel. And it's a good way, I think, of, of also just um, talking through what you're learning as well. Um, that's one of the best ways to really kind of anchor it in your in your memory, so that it, it kind of it doesn't doesn't go away. You know, it it sticks with you. So, um, just making best possible use, I think, of, of what is there to socialize in a in a kind of different way. But the opportunities are still there. They're just in, they look slightly different. Oh yeah, I, when we've, sorry, I'd also sorry. sorry quick plug. <laughs> also, for uh, DMU Active, actually, in sessions like that that are already running online. And also, uh, we're trying to put on through DME Music um, sort of, um, you know, playlists and online provision around sort of enjoying that kind of musical experience together. So there's lots and lots of things. And I think, yeah, just need to kind of look out for them and recommend them to each other. Thank you. Well, we'll move on to our next question because we've been on a, we've <laughs> stayed a lot on, we've stayed for a long time on this one. Um, how can we access mental health support through DMU? Uh, I think that one. We can direct at uh, Laura, is it? Yeah. Yes, I can yeah. cover that one. Yeah, of course, that's absolutely fine. Um, so you can you can access our single point of access appointments through My Gateway, and um, they're just a place for you to be able to go. Um, they're usually forty five minute appointments, and um, it's an opportunity to discuss your situation with a member of staff who's trained to chat with you, and they'll be able to point point you to where you need to go next. Um, so whether that's um, perhaps if you need counselling, if that's you need um, perhaps mentoring sessions or anything along that those lines and um, they can help you do that and um, so yeah that's available through my gateway yeah it's important to say that, that none of that kind of student welfare provision has gone away um, it's just being offered in a slightly different format but as Laura says it's all there for you um, and uh, and we're really well aware that right now students well-being is probably maybe feels a little more shaky than it might have in the past and there's a lot of work going on within campus within student services to make sure that you do get the support that you need can I just add a couple of things as well, please? Uh, also look at your, your Healthy DMU site as well. Yeah. Again, a wealth of information support there. Uh, one thing I would say to students in in, uh, in halls of residences who may be self-isolating, these groups we've just talked about here, this, uh, friends groups, etc. make use of them. You know, talk to them. Don't keep things bottled in yourself. You know, there's always someone out there who can help you. So it would, no matter what your problem may be or issues may be, don't think you're on your own. Always some, talk to somebody because if you don't, and we want what the issues are and i would definitely encourage you to do more of that um and and also you know just look after each other in your flats and uh, that's one way to certainly help each other from a mental anxiety point of view just be there for each other definitely yeah definitely yeah uh so uh, we're gonna move on to a few questions uh from the comments now so we have one from ali alaid i'm really sorry if i butchered that but um it says hi is there a possibility all lectures become online and there is zero face-to-face -face teaching anymore 
Well, essentially, yes, there is a possibility, but we're not uh, we're not anticipating that um, because we're working very hard to be able to maintain our blended environment, which means again that balance between on campus and online learning. In some of these things, we would be sometimes um, at the at the mercy really of, of government decisions that we have no control over. And if we were in that situation, then we would do what we needed to do. Um, and uh, but we would always be making sure that that your learning carried on and that your learning outcomes could be met. I think when we don't live in a world right now where we can say that that anything is without the possibility of happening. Unfortunately, it just everything gets thrown at us in from unexpected directions constantly. But it's not something, as I said, that we're anticipating. Um, if we find that we're in that position, your learning would still carry on. Um, and that at the very first opportunity of reverting, returning to uh, to the blended offer and the face-to-face -face on campus offer, that's where we would be. Thank you very much. Um, we've now got a question from Lis Lister. Lister, don't know if I got that right or wrong. I'm not very good at my reading. Um, is uni going to be closed earlier? Who would like to take this one? Um, maybe I'll start again. Yeah. Um, so I guess it depends on if you mean uh, in the run up to the end of term, or if you mean sort of all the way into next spring. Um, but the answer to, need, to both of those is that there's absolutely no plans to do anything like that. So um, the, the academic calendar that we're on, which started on the 5th of October, it keeps going through the weeks of term one, then into the weeks of term two, and into the exam period in the spring through the summer. If again, if you're, think, if you're asking is the university going to physically close earlier, then again, there was absolutely no plans for that. And there's been no sense coming from the government at all that they uh, anticipate or want universities to physically close. And we would not do that unless that was absolutely required and, and mandated. That would be absolutely the, the last resort because we think it's, it's just really important to have the physical university open, not only for your learning, but also for the other services that are available, the library, for instance, study spaces, sports, and et cetera. Um, it, we, we want it to be there for you in as full a way as possible within the COVID constraints that we're operating under. So is the university going to close earlier? No, unless somebody comes along and bangs us on the head and says, we must do it, we are not going to close earlier. Well, uh, yeah, very much. thank you very much. Fingers crossed that doesn't happen. Uh, we've got a question now from Farouk Sahail, I believe I said that right. Uh, how many classes are on campus nowadays? So I believe, would this be another question yet again for you? It might be, yes, I think so. Um, so every program looks a little different to every other program. Um, and uh, that's because there's different nature of content, different nature of teaching. Um, the classes or the programs that are very practical or hands-on, so things around uh, that use labs, for instance, that use workshops, that use studios, that even they use performance space, those kind of things. There are, there's more of that kind of teaching on campus than there is the kind of teaching where uh, you would, for instance, go to a classroom, a seminar room, and have a kind of discussion-based kind of, of chat, so things that are more like in the humanities or in the social sciences. So there's more on-campus teaching for those practical sessions than there are for the, for the classroom sessions, that we would call them. But there is also on-campus teaching for the classroom sessions. So it would be difficult, you know, sort of going, we'd have to kind of go program by program to really enumerate it, um, but uh, it, so there's, there is a variety there. But we very much wanted to make sure that um, for those programs where you kind of really needed to be in a space using stuff, that we prioritized getting that kind of classes on campus so that you could carry on with the kind of learning that you were doing. And you know, this also includes things like, for instance, uh, media broadcasting, because you have to get your hands on stuff sometimes, don't you? You know, you, you can't always just do it on the other end of the computer. So um, it's we've done the best that we can to try to achieve that balance, again, between using on-campus facilities and, and using um, online opportunities. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say like media production is one of those courses that got, you know, really, just really, you know, left it's out. Really but, awkward, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, um, we're working through it, but um, Maddie, I'll let you intro this question. Okay, um, 
Vin... Okay, I mean, uh, can you read the name for me? I, uh, I believe it says Venusian, who said... Venusian. No yeah. Sorry, uh, no questions so far. Um, but students, I want to say I really appreciate DMU's community to our safety. Commitment. Oh. That's great to hear. I'm really yeah. glad that to, to hear you say that because it's absolutely top of the top of the commitment pile, right alongside offering you the, the strongest possible um, teaching that we can within our constraints. But you know, those two things, twin pillars of what we've been working on for this year. Definitely. Uh, we've got one now from Asian Stat, which says, "How does DMU ensure health and safety in the student dormitory?" So I believe Umesh, would this be a question for you? Okay, uh, thank you. So um, we, we have halls at the university, uh, dormitories at the university. Young. We have them with our sort of partners, our, our nominations, and then there's a wider population of accommodation out there. And what we can definitely say is that we've got strict policy and procedures in place um, that actually have been adapted to make sure that they, they are compliant and say health and safety and COVID compliant. Uh, from a safety point of view, certainly within our halls, we have uh, monitors that actually patrol the building uh, during the evenings and nights, so there's always somebody around the halls. A lot of our private providers have got security services that actually, um, and, and building attendants that are actually walking around the halls as well. Um, there's a shared commitment from all of us, and we meet on a regular basis, and we actually share you know, issues and the challenges and how we overcome those as well. So we're learning from each other as well, and what are good practices, making sure that these providers are actually all doing the same as well. Um, so we are making it safe. You know, safety is a two-way thing. So, you know, we can do our bit, but we need you students as well to behave in a safe manner as well and look after yourself and, and follow the guidelines. So as long as you do that, then we can go and we can commit to making sure that you are in a safe environment. Thank you very much. And just waiting for the next question. Um, considering sports, what are the safe safety measures in place? Um, would that be a question? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that again as well. So. Um, thank you, Maddie. Not a problem. Uh, again, leisure comes in within some uh, state areas. So we have sporting facilities indoor and outdoor, and uh, um, it's one of the few things that were the last to be sort of relaxed from a government point of view. Uh, we have been working extensively with the uh, various sporting bodies. Each sporting body is slightly different in terms of what their requirements are, whether it's football, basketball, table tennis, gym, etc. Uh, outdoor swimming pool as well, and outdoor sports. So. We put measures in place to deal with that. Uh, what we have done in our leisure centre is made sure that you can only book activities. You have to book in a slot, so you have to go online, you know, book your slot so you can go in there. If you want to use a gym, you'll have a one and a half hour slot, so you go in that time, so that we're not overcrowded in the space, making sure there's a you know a minimum amount of people within within the gym area, as well as the classes, whether it's Pilates, yoga, etc. There's a reduction in numbers, so, so we're COVID compliant and social distancing. And again, you book yourself on that and make sure that actually, you know, we are there. We've got wipes, we're cleaning the areas on a regular basis. After every time somebody uses gym equipment, all the class equipment, uh, that's all done in the swimming pool areas. Uh, it's absolutely safe to use. And, uh, you know, we've had uh, confirmation from the local authorities that we've got no problems in using these facilities as well. So uh, um, by all means, look at our website. They'll give you times, dates, and as to what activities are possible. Some activities are not possible yet because of team events. I think there are issues regarding uh, the rule of six, etc. So you can't have football game five aside. Well, five aside is fine. We can't have live football games inside. So again, do look at our website, and uh, you'll get more information on that. You can also download the DMU Leisure app, which also connects with the swimming pool and the gym and everything. Because I have that, and I'm going to the gym quite regularly, keeping fit, keeping healthy. Um, and you can book on there and sort of um, have. Members sort out your membership as well. If you want to join it as well, I thought I'd put it out there quickly. Thank you very um, much, uh, Jeff. Pet, is that I, I believe she, you had something else to add. Um, yeah, yeah I can. Me. Thank you. I'm coming from DMU Sports. Thank you. Um, also, um, so yeah, Umesh is right, he's covered a lot of it. It's um, genuinely took it all really seriously, and all the different sporting regulations and, and the rules from the sporting governing bodies were, uh, were adhered to. Um, so all of the sports club information is now uh, available on the DMU Sport website. Um, and uh, there apparently, I'm 
the head of DMU Sport is texting me, which is brilliant. Um, over 40 clubs and DMU Active to get involved in. So everything is still running. And um, we're able to kind of ensure your safety as far as possible uh, within the rules and regulations. So yeah, just go to the website, DMU Sport, and check out what they're saying. And your teams, if you are a team member, will be able to help you as well. Thank you very much. Sweet. Um, okay, I'll hand over to Callum for this one. Okay. Uh, so the question is, how have classes been split up for safety? Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll pick this one up. So um, one of the very first things we did all the way back in, I think it was April or May, Umesh will, will tell me exactly when we did this, um, because we knew that we would have to be coming into the coming academic year with social distancing in place. We went across the whole campus and basically, I'll, I'll use layperson's terms, we measured out the rooms in terms of how many people could fit in the rooms, keeping in mind the social distance requirements. And uh, right away, it was pretty plain that basically, if you if you might have usually fit in 100 people, now you could fit in maybe about 20. So um, that was the very first thing that we did. And then from that, we then started making decisions about how much on-campus teaching we would actually have because we wanted to make sure we could use the room safely and not accidentally get too many people into any one room. So they've been split up exactly for safety to observe social distancing, to make the best possible use of the rooms. And this is also why we decided very early on that all of our lectures, you know, the kind of thing where you would usually be in a room with a couple of hundred people where you would just sit there and listen, we decided that those would go online and be pre-recorded because then it meant we could use those bigger rooms for, for different kinds of teaching and not have to, in essence, in the current situation we're in, use up the timetable on that kind of teaching when it could just as easily be done in a pre-recorded way. So the whole approach to the, the physical, uh, the physical, what sort with the sort of physicality of teaching on campus has been exactly following safety guidance. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, personally, as a person with dyslexia and dyspraxia, I find that the online lectures, I can stop and start them and write down notes and go back. And I find it a lot more easier to follow than actually being in a, le <laughs> being in a lecture. Um, I don't know about you, Callum, but I- Yeah, no, I was, I was generally gonna second you being in mm. more or less the same boat. I mean, you know, um, I'm kind of getting on and up, but you know, we, yeah. we've got to stick with what we've got, but um, we're going to move it on now. And uh, we're going to ask the question, what physical precautions are there on campus? So um, I believe, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I can start off with that one. Thank you, Callum. So I, I, I mentioned one or two of those at the beginning of uh, the talk, but I can certainly uh, uh, sort of remind colleagues to get people again. So we've, we've put everything from um, signage to direct people uh, which way to go in. Uh, we've got one-way systems where it's possible and allows us to actually safely get people out uh, in a one-way direction so you're not crossing the paths. Uh, we've got barriers and screens up uh, in places to make sure that we're uh, shielding people from reception areas and other spaces and within computer labs and other areas in the library. If you go into a library, you see screens in there. Uh, we've removed furniture so that uh, you're not actually sitting too close together and you're maintaining social distances. And that's not just in the breakout spaces. It's also actually in uh, all the teaching spaces as well. Um, we put hand sanitizers in our toilet areas. We've had to sort of uh, close off uh, cubicles and uh, wash down basins to again to make sure that we're making sure there's physical distance. So everything that we can do, we have done in place. And, uh, and you know, obviously we'll be uh, constantly reviewing the government guidelines because they do change. And uh, sometimes, you know, it has an impact on what we have to do. And if they do change and we have to look at doing things more, we will go back and do more of that as well. There's also lots of signage outside as well, banners, you know, to remind people to uh, to observe social distancing, to wash hands. We put a lot more soap dispensers and towels everywhere, so to encourage people to wash their hands more frequently, and if not, then to use hand sanitizers uh, as often as possible. Within the faculty spaces, specialist spaces, um, you know, we've we've worked with the faculties to identify exactly how teaching is to be delivered. It goes back to sort of the previous question and worked with a specialist in there to say, how do we actually do lab practical work? What are the things that we need in place there? In art and design, some of the uh, uh, workshops in there, there's sort of portable screens that we put in there. So if you're having to show somebody close up, you know, how things are done, then you've got a physical barrier in place so that you're actually not coming into contact with individuals. So all of these places we've worked extensively with, I uh, would say the experts and the technical managers within these spaces to advisors, how do we carry out these activities? give the students the best 
uh, experience they can, but at the same time maintain uh, social distancing and comply with the guidelines. Thank you very much. Um, is there any support available for students with poor internet connections to help with blended learning? Now, um, my internet is not the best. I don't know about you, Callum. It, it's very temperamental. Um, uh, I feel quite blessed. Well. Um, but who would like to take this question? Very good. I'll you. start with that. Um, so. Uh, so yes, there is. But um, so what we've what we've put together, and again, you can find out more information about this in the IT student handbook, and also through your DMU future. For students who have um, equipment or internet issues and aren't able to get onto campus to to say use the the free Wi-Fi that's available across all of campus, um, there is a process that you can kind of apply to. Uh, it's kind of IT hardship scheme, and what that means is that you would you would demonstrate. Your um, the, the issue that you're having, and then we would find out if there was a way in which we could help to support you to make sure that you could access the the blended, you know, the online um, elements of your learning. We would we would in the first instance expect students who could to basically use what's available on campus. So using the Edgybrome and using the Wi-Fi, and we put together as well um, a kind of uh, campus map that shows you all of the places on campus that you can go to study um, and to use quiet spaces and to use the Wi-Fi. So these are available rooms, available spaces in, in all the buildings across campus and showing you when they're available. So that, for instance, if you also might have a day where for maybe a couple of hours in the day, you've got something on campus and a couple of hours in the day, you've got something online um, and you're thinking, does that mean I've got to run back and forth from home or something? Uh, there you go, library at dmu uh, library.dmu see that you can get it out my mouth um, and if you go on there then you will be able to find the list of where these spaces are so the first port of call is really to use what the university has to offer you um, you don't need to stay at home if you can get to campus and make use of the, the wi-fi make use of the study spaces that are available thank you very much <laughs> Um, does the university plan to hold exams as normal this academic year? Um, who would like to take this one? A lot do seem to come to me, but that's that's to be <laughs> expected. Um, exams as normal, so that's a that's one of those really interesting questions. Um, exams will be held where they have to be held. If by as normal, uh, you mean sort of trooping everybody into very large rooms and sitting at desks very close to each other and for two or three hours to take an exam, quite possibly not. Um, you may have noticed that a couple of weeks ago we ran an online student uh, consultation about did you agree if we should plan for an online exam period in the coming spring and summer? Um, and the, the huge vast majority of those who answered, some 3,000 odd students answered, a huge vast majority said, yes, we should definitely plan for this. And we are going to plan for this because who knows where we'll be in the spring. If you need to take an exam, we need to make sure you can take that exam with the, the best support possible and in the best situation possible. If they need to be online, we're gonna start planning now so that it will work to the best possible effect in the spring. Yeah, and if I could just sort of follow on from that point, um, we'll completely, th throughout the way through, um, we'll make sure that we're doing what's best for you sort of academically, but also definitely um, from a safety perspective as well. Um, because at the end of the day, we want you to be able to succeed, but we want you to be really safe whilst doing so. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that's all uh, That's all for our live stream about your DMU safety today. Thank you for watching and thank you to our guests, Jackie Lab, Umesh Desai, Fee Donovan and Laura from DSU for joining us and answering questions. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Yeah. So remember, you can find out more about your DMU safety uh, on the website, dmu.ac.uk slash your DMU safety. So that's all from me. That's all from Maddie, that's all from us, and we will see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.